warm welcome to everyone who has come here today on this, the third Sunday of the season of Pentecost, which also serves as our Confirmation Sunday. Today we'll use the order of worship that you find printed in the bulletin, and that order of worship is morning praise. Let's begin our worship by singing the opening hymn, a hymn which uh, asks God to speak to us in his word. It's hymn 735. It's printed in that gray worship supplement booklet. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, mighty judge of all people, we admit and confess our sinfulness. We have not lived up to our calling as your faithful people. So often we have done the evil you forbid, and too many times we have not done the good you demand. We do repent and are truly sorry for our sins in thought, word, and deed. Have mercy on us, merciful Father, 
For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, forgive us all wrongs that need your grace, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, direct us to serve you faithfully all our days, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If this is our heartfelt confession, then there is good news for us. The Heavenly Father sent us His Son Jesus to atone for our sins. In Him, God's kingdom has already come among us. This does not come to us because we confess it, but because God's grace, God's choice, God's intervention in Jesus saves us from our sins. Do you believe this? I do so believe. Because of Christ's redemptive work, we are a redeemed and forgiven people. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This very forgiveness is God's good news for us today, for tomorrow, forever. Amen. Please rise. <laughs> oh, oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O oh God. Oh Lord, come quickly to help me. Give glory to God, our Lord and our life. Come, oh, come, let us worship. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. You are a great and a wondrous God, cupping in your hands all the depths of earth. You made the hills and the mountains high. You made the seas and the dry land. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. Come, let us worship and bow in low. Kneel before the one who has made us all. You are the God whom we call our own. We are the flock that you shepherd. Come, oh, come, let us sing. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. You may be seated. The first scripture lesson for this Confirmation Sunday is the lesson from the Old Testament from the book of Daniel chapter 9 beginning at verse 1. The Old Testament lesson will also serve as the sermon text for this morning. In the first year of Darius son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, 
who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Here ends the first scripture lesson. The psalm for today is Psalm 119b. You're invited to join with me in singing the psalm as it's printed in the bulletin. second scripture lesson is the epistle lesson recorded in Paul's second letter to Timothy chapter 3 beginning at verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here ends the epistle lesson. Alleluia, your words became a joy to me and the delight of my heart. Alleluia. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 24 beginning at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? 
they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Clopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Here ends the Holy Gospel. We continue by singing the hymn of the day, hymn 784 in the Christian Worship Supplement Book. You may be seated. Mercy and peace are yours from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today is the Old Testament lesson recorded in the book of Daniel, chapter 9. I'll read verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. And we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, but especially on this is the day of your confirmation, dear Alyssa and Emma. The textbook that has been used in the Lutheran Church for almost 500 years now for confirmation class is Luther's small catechism. 
And you learned, of course, that a catechism is a book that teaches by means of questions and answers. And we use Luther's catechism because it is a short summary, a six-part summary of the main textbook for Christians, which is, of course, the Bible. And you learned, as you use Luther's small catechism, that one of Luther's favorite questions was, what does this mean? And Luther, of course, stole that one from the crowd on Pentecost. When the crowd heard the sound of the mighty rushing wind, saw the tongues of fire, and heard unlearned men speak in other known languages, they asked that question. What does this mean? But there are other questions found in Luther's small catechism. His second most favorite question that he likes to ask, it's found in the section on baptism and the use of the keys and confession and the Lord's Supper, is this one. Where is this written? Where is this written? Our procedure in confirmation class was to ask a question and then try to find our answers from a passage in the Bible. And so where is this written meant that initially you had to be able to find your way around the Bible. And so that required memorizing the 66 books of the Bible so that when you encountered a passage you could find it. You could instantly know, oh, that's an Old Testament passage, or that's a New Testament passage. You could find where that was written. But I think that that question, where is this written, has a broader implication to it. I think it implies that Christians, if we're going to believe something, we need to be able to go to what is written and find our answers there. And I think that's our prayer for you today on the day of your confirmation, that you might always be inclined to first and foremost search the scriptures so that you can find your answers for your life from what is written. This brings us to our text for this morning. It comes from the book of Daniel, and I believe that you too are familiar with the Old Testament figure named Daniel. He was living in Jerusalem, minding his own business, when the armies of Babylon rolled up to Jerusalem and took him and some of his friends captive to Babylon. He was probably around your age when that happened. He was trained in the courts of the king to be a wise man. He uh, was very knowledgeable, and yet he was a believer in God living in a land of unbelievers. And this summer we're going to look, take a look at Daniel quite a bit at our Sunday services because I think more and more we are like Daniel. We are believers living more and more in a land of unbelievers. And we need to get used to that, and we need to adjust to it the way Daniel did. One of Daniel's most harrowing experiences and trials that he faced, of course, was when his enemies wanted to feed him to the lions, and God preserved him from that. Anyway, at this time in our text, Daniel is an older man, and he has a question that he wants answered. And being a wise man, I suppose he could have said, well, I think this, or I think that. This was also the man to whom God had given the ability to interpret dreams, a man to whom God had given great visions. But Daniel had enough discipline to say, hold it, if I have a question, and I need that question answered, then I want to get my answer from the Bible. I want to get my understanding of what's going on in my life from the Word of God. And again, that's our prayer for you today on this, the day of your confirmation, that you might always be eager and willing to gain your understanding from the Word of God. What is it that Daniel wanted to understand? Well, he had a real simple question. How long? 
Uh, Daniel wasn't an uh, uh, impetuant little child sitting in the back seat of the car, screaming every five minutes, are we there yet? How long is this trip going to take? But Daniel was an exile living in a foreign land, and he wanted to know how long this period of time was going to last. He called it the time of the desolation of Jerusalem in our text for this morning. And so Daniel asked a question, where is it written? Could I possibly find the answer to my question from the Bible? Well, several decades prior to this time, there was another prophet of God living in Jerusalem. His name was Jeremiah. And God instructed Jeremiah to write a letter from Jerusalem to the exiles living in Babylon. And so Daniel got a copy of Jeremiah's letter. And he started to search it. He started to read it. And then he came across that part that we today call chapter 25. And there he read that Babylon would hold the exiles in captivity for 70 years years. And then after that period of 70 years, God would punish the kingdom of Babylon. And he kept reading, and four chapters later in chapter 29, he read these words that Jeremiah recorded from the Lord. This is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to Jerusalem. Well, there it is. The answer to Daniel's question was written right there in the pages of Scripture. So Daniel gained an understanding of himself, his life, his existence, the existence of his fellow believers from the Word of God. So do you, too, have questions? Do you, too, want to gain an understanding about something. Well, of course you do. And let's start with the biggie, right? The jailer at Philippi asked the question, a very poor question, but a question nonetheless. What must I do to be saved? And with that question, he revealed this notion that he had that he had to do something in order to be saved. And Paul and Silas answered that question, not with do, 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 but with believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. So you get your answers about that biggie question about how to be saved, not from nature, but from the revealed knowledge of God, from the pages of Holy Scripture. Emma, you get your knowledge about where your grandpa is and where Aunt Wilma is, not from nature, but from the pages of Holy Scripture, right? Whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. Sometimes we face questions in this life that I would describe as unwelcome questions. Questions that come our way that we are forced to deal with even though we would rather not. And if we find ourselves in that situation, let us remember that we're not alone because that's exactly what happened to Jesus. You remember from the Gospels how often people, especially his enemies, would come up to him with questions intending to trap him in his words, intending to insinuate that he was a bad guy, that he was sinning or that he was doing something wrong. And in confirmation class, we considered many of the questions and issues that come from society today, and we tried to deal with them on the basis of God's Word. But recently, I'm, I'm thinking about another brand new thing that is coming our way about which there are many questions. And I want to use it as an example this morning. All over the news, is this new issue known as transgenderism. And this is an issue that's pertinent for you because you too go to public school and next year you're going to be in public high school and this whole thing has to do with bathrooms and who can use what bathroom and what locker room. Okay, 
Let's stop right there and ask our question. Where is this written? Is there anything in the Bible that speaks to this? That's our first and foremost question, right? Okay, well, if we start searching the scriptures, we are in luck. We don't have to plow through 25 chapters of Jeremiah. All we have to do is open up to the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. And what do we find in Genesis chapter 1? We could just find this simple statement. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, well, at least now, we can gain an understanding of how God made things, how God intends things to be, that human beings come in two forms, male and female, not in seven genders or 58 Facebook genders or whatever, but in two forms, male and female. Now we have an understanding, and where does our understanding come from? It comes from the Word of God. The second point that I want to raise for you today is this. Our understanding of things is always received within the context of a bigger understanding of God's plan and God's will for all people. Let's use as our example Daniel. You know he had that question, how long is this exile going to last? And he searched the scriptures and he found his answer, it's going to last 70 years. Why was he concerned about that? So he could schedule it on his calendar, okay, well now I'm organized, I got this scheduled. That wasn't it at all. Daniel was concerned about this because he understood the plan of salvation. He understood that God's plan of salvation involved God's people living in the promised land, inhabiting the city of Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple in that city. He knew that God had promised that the Savior, the Savior was going to come, would be born in the city of Bethlehem, which is just a stone's throw away from the city of Jerusalem. And he knew that if the Savior was going to come and be the suffering Savior, who would take on himself the sin of the world, then that Savior, the prophet, would have to die where the other prophets died, namely in the city of Jerusalem. And so Daniel's primary concern, and the reason that he had this question, had to do with the bigger picture the picture of God's plan of salvation and God's will for all people, that all people be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. You see, Alyssa and Emma, it is one thing to gain an understanding of something from God's word. But it is another thing to receive that answer within the context of the bigger picture of God's plan of salvation and God's will for all people. Let me tell you how this often goes. This is the way it goes with me. You know, I, I encounter something that's, that's being promoted in society and I say, oh, where is this written? And, and so I do my research and I find my answers. But then when I have my answers, of course, about other people's conduct, never about my own conduct, then I want to take that answer and I want to use it, you know, like a baseball bat to beat somebody over the head with it. You might call that opposition research or legalistic research. Now, when you two, of course, get to high school, you're going to be required to do research papers going to look at what others have written, you're going to quote that to build your case, okay? And I think that's a trap that's something that Christians like myself often fall into. We get our answers, all right, from the pages of Holy Scripture, but we fail to get them within that bigger context, which is God's plan of salvation. And you know what God's plan of salvation is, right? You know that Daniel was concerned for a reason. It was necessary that those people go back and that they re-inhabit the city of Jerusalem 
and that nearby city named Bethlehem. God's plan of salvation was that he send for each of you two, his son, born in the flesh, born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem. His plan was that his son come for you to live in the way that neither of you can live, perfectly, holy, uh, sinless. And then God's ultimate plan was that his son take your sins on himself and pay for them on the cross of Calvary outside the city of Jerusalem and that he be buried outside the city but on the third day rise again so that you might know without doubt with all certainty that your sin is forgiven and that even that horrible monster known as death has no power over you anymore so asking where is this written is done with a desire to have a proper understanding of God's will but not to find some kind of hammer that you can beat your neighbor over the head with, okay? And as I say that, I, I think about the life and ministry of Jesus. Just stop for a minute to think about the people that Jesus came into contact with. He came into contact with tax collectors, those who charged too much in taxes, those who ripped people off. <coughs> And I suppose Jesus could have said to himself, hmm, is there anything written in the Bible about these people and their conduct? And of course there is, and you know very well that there is, right? The seventh commandment declares you shall not steal. And I suppose he could have taken that and used it as a baseball bat to beat them over the head. <coughs> or there was one time when a woman caught in adultery was dragged before Jesus and I suppose Jesus could have said, hmm, is there anything written about this woman and her conduct? And of course there is, and you know very well that there is in the sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And I suppose he could have used that to beat her over the head with that truth as well. And yet what did Jesus do? He, he recognized those truths, but he realized that they were true within a bigger context of his love for all people and his desire that people be brought to repentance and his desire that all people be saved. Emma and Alyssa, you know very well that in your life you're going to rub shoulders with people who do not live in conformity to God's will. And some of those people are these people that have been called the transgenders. You know, sometimes sin is so powerful and strong, it affects people in certain ways. And so some people come into this world and they are not clearly delineated XX and XY according to their gender. Some people are just flat out confused about their gender because their mom and dad haven't said, oh, you're a boy and this is how things go with boys and you're a girl and this is how things go with girls. And some people are just flat out in rebellion against God concerning the gender that God has assigned to them. And the world is going to insinuate that if you don't acknowledge 53 or more genders that you must be some kind of a hater or you must be a bully or you must be phobic in some sort of way. And if you're like me, I have to tell you, I really, really resent that. You and I don't have it in for anyone, let alone that 0.1 to 0.3 percent of our society that is gender confused. It is so insulting to us to say, well, because you're this, you must allow that. What most people who believe in the Bible resent is this notion that the only way that we can show love for these people is to share a bathroom and a locker room with them. Let's start where we need to start. We asked the question, what does the Bible say about this? And we heard that God made people male and female. But we receive that answer within the bigger context of the, that bigger picture, right, of God's will for all people, that all be brought to repentance and that all be saved. And we will avoid that trap of finding our answer to use it as a weapon or a baseball bat, but we'll also use, avoid that trap 
of regarding uh, the golden rule as a license for anything and everything that society wants. Instead, we'll walk that middle road, that middle road, that hard road that Christians have been called to walk, holding firmly to God's word, but also understanding and living out in our day-to-day -day lives God's plan for everyone, for tax collectors, for adulterers, for people who are gender confused, that all come to repentance, have faith in Jesus, and finally be saved. Where is it written? Asking that question requires some self-discipline. At least it does for me. Because somebody, when somebody asks a question of me, I always want to say, oh, this is what I think. Does that really matter? All that matters really is what God thinks, right? And so we seek to find our answers for life, for salvation from the pages of Scripture. And be aware, some of the answers that you get, you may not like. I highly doubt that Daniel liked the answer, 70 years. For him, that meant, oh, I'm probably not going to be able to go to Jerusalem. I'm already 80 years old, too old to travel. Well, whatever the case, we're still going to ask that question, right? We're going to seek to get our answers from the Bible, but we're always going to do that in light of that bigger understanding that we have of God's grace and mercy. His will for you and for all, that all of us come to repentance, that all of us have faith in Jesus, and that all of us ultimately be saved. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We sing the Te Deum Canticle as our confession of faith. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father, holy, all creation offers praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. You, O Father, holy, all creation offers praise. With the angels in heaven, Cherubim and seraphim, we praise you, we praise you. With apostles and prophets, we praise you, we praise you. With the martyrs and your holy church, we sing in and bless praise. You are God, we praise you. Christ, the Son of God, we praise you, we praise you. O Spirit most holy, we praise you, we praise you. To the Trinity most blessed,
have risen to free us. We praise you, we praise you, and with all your saints in glory, we sing in endless praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, all creation offers praise. All creation offers praise. All creation offers praise. We worship God with our offerings. You may be seated. rise for prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, for reasons known to yourself alone, you have entrusted more abundant gifts to some than to others. Bestow on each of us a rich measure of your Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the gifts you have given us. Dearest Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, open our hearts by your love to give of our time, talents, and treasures in the same proportion as the Father in love has prospered us. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Lord, Christ, Lord, have mercy. Our Father, in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we offer a prayer for John Landenberger and his family. Uh, this past week, John's sister Wilma was suddenly called out of this life to her home in heaven. We also offer a prayer for Andy Petrie, who continues to uh, recovery, re recover from a uh, fractured hip uh, in, uh, which he uh, received in Florida, we pray. Blessed Father, you have bestowed on us an understanding of your will for us and the salvation your Son won for us through what is written in the Bible. 
Your desire for us is to always turn to what is written so that we can gain an understanding of our own salvation and also your will for our neighbor from what we find there. You have preserved us today for us the example of faithful Daniel to encourage us to always search the scriptures for our answers. Grant that Emma and Alyssa might have the same diligence their entire life as your children. Blessed Father, much in our world is passed off as love, as the following of the golden rule, but when all of that is disconnected from your word, it becomes an impractical and non-commonsensical effort which is an embarrassment to our earthly leaders. Grant to our earthly rulers the humility to find their answers from you in your word instead of claiming to have your backing when it comes to their own ideas and edicts. Gracious Father, we thank you for the progress in healing you are granting to our brother Andy Petrie, whose broken hip continues to heal. Watch over Andy and his wife Carol. Give them patience and grant that soon Andy can leave the nursing home in Florida and continue his rehabilitation work from their condominium in Florida. Lord God, Lord of life and death, who turns people to destruction and declares, return to dust, you children of men. We humbly give you thanks today for all of the benefits of body and soul which during her life you bestowed upon Wilma Landenberger, who has so suddenly been called from this life. We pray that you would comfort John and awaken in all of us a sincere repentance and true faith that we may be ever ready when your summons to leave this world comes and that in the hour of our departure we may commit our souls and bodies into your hands fall asleep with joy to eternal life, and finally rise on the last day in bliss and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our only mediator and redeemer. Amen. You may be seated for the rite of confirmation. Okay, girls, right here. Okay, yeah, sure, step right on up here. There you go. Our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to the Lord's command, you have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You have been taught the precious truths of the Christian faith as confessed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church. You know what God has given you by his grace and what he expects of you as his dear child. You have the privilege now of receiving the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament of Holy Communion. You are here to make a public profession of your Christian faith. The apostle writing to the Romans said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you this day, in the presence of God and of this congregation, acknowledge that in baptism God gave you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? I do. You reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises. I do. Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? I do. 
Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God? I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this teaching and to endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it? Yes, and I ask God to help me. And do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the teachings of God's word, to be faithful in the use of the word and sacrament, and in faith and action remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as long as you live? Yes, and I ask God to help me. Since it is God alone who enables us both to will and to do his good pleasure, it is right for us to call on him for these confirmands that he would graciously complete the good work which he begun, has begun in them. Let us therefore pray. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith in mercy, you joined these young women to your church when they were born again of water and the spirit. In mercy you taught them your saving truth. Grant that they may offer themselves as living sacrifices to you as their spiritual act of worship. Transform them by the renewing of their minds so that they will not conform to the pattern of this world. Help all of us to live in love and harmony with one another and to work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what we as a Christian congregation have here asked our Heavenly Father to confer on all of you, we now ask him to give each one of you individually. Emma Landenberger, May, the, may God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, give you his Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, of grace and prayer, of power and strength, of sanctification and the fear of God. The passage from God's word, which has been selected as your confirmation passage, is recorded in Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 20, chapter 2, verse 20 where Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Alyssa Meister, may the Father in heaven for Jesus' sake renew and increase in you the gift of the Holy Spirit, to the strengthening of your faith, to your growth in grace, to your patience in suffering, and to the blessed hope of eternal life. Alyssa, the passage which has been selected as your confirmation passage is recorded in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. There you are. I now declare you both to be confirmed members of this congregation. Your church invites you to receive the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood when it is offered. Accept this invitation with deep reverence and holy joy. Rega regard your communion at the Lord's table as a precious privilege given to you by God through his church. Receive this sacrament thankfully and often. The Almighty and most merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you. Amen. Okay, you can return to your seats. Please rise. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. 
Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless and keep you. Amen. The Lord's face ever shine upon you. Amen. The Lord grant you peace for all your days. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn 597, printed in the red hymnal. To all of our visitors today who have joined us for worship, we're glad you're here. Please come again and worship with us again. A special uh, welcome to the uh, friends and family of Alyssa Meister and also Emma Landenberger. Welcome. There are a few announcements. Uh, this Tuesday, the church council will meet at 7 o'clock. Uh, and then uh, on Thursday, the Bible class during the summer will meet at 7 p.m. in the basement, and Friday men's Bible class meets at noon. Uh, an announcement in the bulletin is also concerning uh, John's sister, Wilma Landenberger. Her funeral will be this coming Wednesday in Cleveland, Ohio. There uh, is an announcement there about the Lutheran Women's Mission Society, which is a big, huge gathering that's going to take place in uh, St. Charles, nearby St. Charles, on June 23rd through June 26th. And next Sunday, uh, after church, there's going to be an effort to put together a display table on our mission in Columbia. If you'd like to help with that, uh, you can uh, stay after church uh, and do that. And then there's a note in there about the uh, gifts of, that were given by the Sunday School children. That was uh, directed toward the uh, Lutheran Women's Missionary uh, Society effort known as their CARE program uh, uh, for a total of $169. We are going to uh, offer, uh, we're going to have a, a brief presentation now for our two uh, confirmands, for Emma and Alyssa. So, uh, I'll ask the elder of our congregation, Mr. Mike Spangel, to, uh, to come forward for that presentation. Okay, girls, stand right here and face the congregation.